So, Aidan Tynan, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Uh, thank you, James. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, your book, which was published in 2020, The Desert in Modern Literature and Philosophy, Wasteland Aesthetics, which is part of the cross, I believe it's called the Cross Current series, which is being edited by Chris Watkin. Um, So this was published in 2020. And as people can imagine, uh, the desert in modern literature and philosophy, it's taking the the metaphor, the allegory, the place of the sort of the infamous desert where people often retreat, they go and have some mind expanding, epiphantic experience, or it's this the desert of the real as it would probably the most well-known contemporary uh iteration of it philosophically is from Slavoj Žižek uh and this this idea of the desert throughout philosophy and literature and its place and why it's stayed the course and why it's still somehow not become a cliche actually um but before we dive into the book and the question of the desert um yeah Aiden just tell us a little bit about yourself uh what it is you do and and how this uh peculiar book came about uh well yeah thanks James uh I mean uh I I've I've been obsessed with the philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari for many years. Uh, I, I wrote my PhD on Deleuze's theory of literature as a as a a clinical and and, and critical enterprise, like an an enterprise of health and self diagnosis. Um, uh, I, I did my PhD at Cardiff University with Ian Buchanan, uh, and uh, I ended up I, I guess in uh, a very interdisciplinary situation. I was neither a philosopher nor a literary critic, uh, or a literary scholar. Um, uh, so I found myself at something of a crossroads and this concept of the desert really spoke to me. Uh, uh, my initial exposure to it, I suppose, comes from uh, uh, Nietzsche's work in uh, uh, Zarathustra, where he talks about the desert of nihilism, and, and there's a, a really wonderfully resonant uh, uh, poem in the middle of that book, where he t- which opens with the phrase "the desert grows" or "the wasteland grows," depending on how you want to translate the German. Uh, uh, and and it was just that phrase, that that three word phrase, "the desert grows," that stuck with me for years as as a PhD student, and then after the PhD. Uh, uh, and and so I, I guess the book grew out of that fascination, uh, and then I, you know, added a few other philosophers to my uh, uh, list of uh, desert thinkers: Deleuze and Guattari, obviously, but also Heidegger, um, Baudrillard, Zizek, as you mentioned, uh, Derrida. Uh, the list kept gr- growing and growing, and I realized I I needed to write a book on, on this, um, uh, and and. Ultimately, it took me about seven or eight years work. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and the outcome was this book, which came out two years ago. Now. So that list kept growing, and I think I think maybe it'd almost be hard for us, especially in the continental, what we define as continental. You'd probably be hard for us to find a philosopher who hasn't, at some point, had their little desert moment. Yeah. Um, roughly speaking. So I mean, maybe an early question just before the homistics question. I mean. Is there a thread between, you know, why these philosophers kept coming in, even though they're not explicitly, obviously, dealing with quite literally, you know, the Sahara, uh, yeah. but this idea of the desert, was there a thread that, you that that you know, connects them all as a, you know, a desert philosopher, or as a desert philosophy? Yeah, I mean, I guess what the, the obvious thread is that none of these philosophers really have much in the way of a direct or intimate contact or any kind of real physical contact with desert landscapes. Uh, in in the literal or physical sense of the word, uh, you know, and I come from Ireland. I live in Britain. This is, uh, uh, you know, we're far away from any real deserts here. Uh, so it was more this motif of the desert, and specifically the idea of the wasteland that really interested me. Why do people who don't come from deserts uh, uh, form a fascination with the desert as this kind of site of geographical alterity? A strange place, a place uh, uh, that exerts this fascination from a distance, um, and so I guess that's the connecting th- one of the connecting threads, I suppose. Uh, I mean, th- the other major one would would be uh, how all of these philosophers and thinkers are concerned with offering up a critique of modernity, 
uh, and the, the desert becomes a geographical figure to do that. Um, it, it allows them, a, 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 it serves as an image for which, from, or, or a vantage point, I should say, from which to, to, to critique the process of modernity. Uh, so that's why I argue in my book that the desert is a topos, right? It's a place, uh, but it's also a figure. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. a figure. Of, a topos is a figure of speech, but it's also a position. It's a place of thought. Um, so all of these thinkers are are seeking a position, a place from which to critique uh, what they see as uh, uh, the devastating uh, forces of modernity. Mm -hmm. They view modernity as a process of laying waste. Uh, Mm. Simply put, I think, which wow. um, which I found really interesting, and I, I I'm still fascinated by that idea. And you know, you, you can make that point from uh, a range of positions across the political spectrum. So Heidegger, for example, makes that makes that argument from the position of a for a fascist, you know, from a fascist position to losing guitar, you're making it from a, an ultra left position. Yeah. Um, uh, so it it's. The desert is a, a really interesting image. It's a conceptual space that seems to condense a lot of things. Uh, uh, it condenses a, a lot of opposites, a lot of oppositions. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting site from which to think. Mm. Well, I'm very excited to sort of dive into the modernity aspect because I'm, you know, it's always the fun thing to do is to critique modernity and to mm -hmm. dive into that sort of wasteland but before yeah. we do so i do have to ask you the humidics question so you can uh place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the conversation uh, who do you who do you pick well i don't know i was thinking about this question all day and um i guess i mean the, the simple answer for me would be marx nietzsche and freud who are you know the thinkers of the the, the crisis of late 19th century thought uh, these are the thinkers of the crisis of modernity essentially but uh uh they would have viewed each other as, as you know, completely different from one another. Uh, uh, Nietzsche definitely ne never read Marx. Freud claimed he never read Nietzsche, although that's probably a lie. Um, so just to see how they would interact with one another in a room, what kind of discussions would unfold, that would be that would be interesting, I guess. Um, uh, uh, but then I also think of the the story of when uh, when James Joyce met Proust in 1922. <laughs> And and everyone's thinking this is going to be a great like mm -hmm. you know exchange of uh, ideas and these two ge literary geniuses are going to have this fantastic conversation, and they just ended up bitching and moaning to each other. Uh, uh, I think Joyce turned up drunk and he opened the window and uh, Proust kept closing it because he was like worried about the draft. I mean he did die a year later or, or <laughs> later that year. So uh, and then and then Joyce asked him, "Have you read Ulysses?" And and, and Proust said, "No, I haven't." Uh, so you know we. We need to be aware as well that uh, these these uh, uh, great thinkers, great writers, aren't necessarily great conversationalists. And um, uh, it also puts me in mind of something that Deleuze once said, that he had a horror of debating. He said debates achieve nothing. Um, that said, he, he you know we we can you know, he did a lot of interviews and dialogues with conversations with people. But uh, uh, but yeah, I, I I like that idea that that. Debating is a, is a pointless activity. Uh, yeah, I remember that specifically. He says, I think, he, doesn't he continue that? And he says that philosophy happens with one person just sat in a room yeah. peacefully writing. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solitary <laughs> dialogue with yourself. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, um, I kind of like that, but I'm a very antisocial person. So, Yeah, yeah, same. And that's yeah. why people have asked me to do debates. And I say, no, because nothing comes of it. Nothing yeah. will ever be, nothing's ever been solved by the way. Well, yeah, yeah. dialogues is different, but the line, the line is fine. I, you mm -hmm. know, I like that answer. Someone, someone else answered that way recently. They said, you put, put, put any three philosophers in a room, they're not going to talk to each other. They're just going to no. try proof that they're right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, speaking of the, you know, you mentioned the Proust Joyce. I always think of Emil Choron in his diaries when he says that he sees Samuel Beckett sat on a bench and he says, I don't want to, I don't want to go disturb him. And I was like, no, yeah, that's, no. The, that's the correct thing to do. You know, to, yeah, nothing's yeah. going to come of this. Okay. That's no. a good answer. Yeah. Mm. No. Okay. Well, <laughs> this sort of <laughs> opens it up to dive into, I mean, I'm sure those thinkers will come back in, especially Nietzsche. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, just to, just to open it up, this almost might seem like a sort of a clumsy or silly question, but I mean, what is a, what is a literal desert and what, what is a, what is the mm. desert that we're talking about? Yeah, I mean that's 
that's a key question that I agonized over <laughs> uh, for many years while writing this book because I realized very early on that I wasn't writing about uh, well, I had a series of realizations. I realized I wasn't writing about the desert in a literal sense, uh, and, and, and neither are many of the, the thinkers and writers I was discussing. Um, but I also had another realization, perhaps uh, a more complex or interesting one, which is that the idea of the desert doesn't e it is an idea. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the desert. Uh, there are multitudes of landscapes uh, 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 with varying degrees of aridity and rainfall. Um, but the desert, as, as it features in our, in our discourse, is much more of a cultural construction uh, than any kind of geographical uh, uh, kind of literal place, you know, mm. uh, uh, and and this is borne out. If you look into this, you know, the science, uh, which I've done a little bit. Uh, there is no, you know, uh, accepted scientific, comprehensive scientific definition of a desert. Uh, generally, scientists talk about you know rainfall, you know, a average annual annual rainfall, but you also get you know deserts which have you know periods of flooding. Mm. Uh, uh, so that really interests me that, that, that the desert in a literal sense is actually, is actually a problematic idea. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think, so Europeans, uh, have a fascination with the desert precisely because it's not, uh, because, because it disrupts, uh, standard definitions of what we consider a place to be right so the desert is is a, is an idea of geographical alterity that disrupts our, our, our sense of what it means to be in a place um and, and, and for derrida or not for derrida for 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 deleuze um uh, deleuze would call this uh, it doesn't get guitari would call this a, a sedentary conception of place right uh, so the so, so the desert, in a sense, is a nomadic landscape, um, uh, and this is why it exerts a kind of fascination, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, precisely on those people who don't who don't come from desert places. Mm. It's super interesting. Maybe maybe I'll say something a tiny, well, not not too pretentious, but so the one of the when I when I saw the title of your book, one of the one of the writers that always comes to my mind when I think of the desert, just in in a, is this abstract lost space who i think is brilliant about writing about it but never explicitly i don't think mentions mm. the desert ever no i haven't read all his work is ballard you know ballard's yep. uh concrete island with just being lost in this strange nomadic yep. space or the way ballard describes a shopping mall or even yeah. you know ourselves going into sort of a shopping mall which has become the the dated one and there's been a new one built and now no one goes here but yeah. it's still working and you think this mm -hmm. is a peculiar peculiar sort of you know Liminal spaces is the big thing in philosophy right now, but it borders on this conception of the desert as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think for Ballard, like a key early experience for him was uh, when he was growing up in Shanghai. This was famously uh, uh, dramatized in, in Empire of the Sun. Uh, uh, all of the houses were, were evacuated and, and you had all these empty swimming pools. Mm. Uh, and, and the figure of the empty swimming pool uh, and that's and that sort of kind of desiccated concrete is kind of figures through all Ballard's writing, and it's it's a key image for him. Um, uh, so I, I mean, again, Ballard Ballard lived in uh, uh, you know an English uh, lived in Shepperton, didn't he? He lived in English suburb mm -hmm. for most of his life, so he wasn't uh, it wasn't a traveler to uh, kind of far flung places. Um, but yeah, his 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 fiction really reflects this this I this this fascination, but also anxiety with the idea of, of depopulated space. Uh, uh, and that ultimately is what, what the, I mean, literally that's what the desert means. Uh, if we trace it etymologically back to ancient Greek, the word eremos uh, means uh, a depopulated place, a place where people are not. Um, so yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, uh, and, and Concrete Island, as you say, is a fascinating book. Um, where you have the instead of the the desert island of Robinson Crusoe, it's just this patch of wasteland under a a, a motorway intersection in London, and uh, yeah, a driver just has to he he's, he gets into a crash and he's he finds himself stranded in this patch of waste ground and he lives there. 
uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, mm. yeah, definitely Ballard is 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 a key figure. It's, it's such a. I mean, I'm now realizing, you know, the, the questions I had are very sort of constrained, but I realize it's such a peculiar topic to to talk about and think about because it is a. It is in, it, I mean, it, it definitely is external, but it's external mm -hmm. in the way that it's intuited. And it's a very difficult thing to say to someone, it's a bit of a desert if they don't understand what you mean by that. It's a bit yeah. of a desert in there if they don't see it. And it, mm -hmm. al it also begs the question with what we've been talking about there is, you know, the space of geographical alterity, as you've said, the, the sort of the deep irony is, is that the alterity is within the, like the deserts now are within places that are meant to be populated. Yeah, and yeah. it's sort of you know I mean I guess a question to sort of open up that 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 concept of modernity. I mean, what does this alterity really show us about the modern world? You know, what's mm -hmm. what's come of this, I guess, imminent failure. You know, this thing we have to pretend is there, but it, we can't ever really grasp it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you look at the history of of capitalism over the last five hundred years or so, it is it is all about finding new frontiers, right? Uh, 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 you know, new resources to exploit, new land, uh, 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 and and you know the the history of Europe then, or the history of you know Euro American capitalism is is this encounter with uh, in many in many cases with, with the deserts of the New World, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so capitalism constantly needs ways to internalize these spaces of geographical alterity. It's something I argue, I think, in the first chapter of, of the book, that um, the reason why, you know, I guess beginning late 19th century or mid 19th century, that the reason why we, we see so much, you know, European, uh, you know, literature and art focusing on the desert is because capitalism needs a way to, to uh, uh, give an ideological expression to these spaces, which it's internalizing. Yeah. So capitalism always needs to express the, the, it, its own cutting edges. Right? Yeah. These frontiers that is constantly swallowing up. Uh, uh, but what that means then is that our ideas of uh, um, our, our ideas of what a desert is uh, uh, transform as well. Um, so we have urban wastelands, food deserts, cultural deserts. This word desert, you know crops up in, in, in many ways, or the idea of desert crops up in many ways. Uh, uh, you know, suburbs are deserts of a type. Uh, and we see this all over the place in our, in our art and culture. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated with this, this kind of, this movement of capitalism to constantly seek out a frontier, but then uh, uh, produce ideological images of it uh, through, through art and culture. Mm. Um, and philosophy as well. Well, I mean, one thing one thing you've made me sort of think about there is the film "There Will Be Blood," right? So this sort mm -hmm. of progression of, I mean, he's quite literally in a desert, as sort of a primitive, yeah. through the industrial revolution of his own, and then yeah. by the end, personally, he doesn't have any more frontiers. He's rich. He's got the mansion, yeah. and he ends up in this sort of drunken haze of madness, just shooting, yeah. shooting ceramics for the sake of boredom. And I want, yeah. do, do you feel that's where we've got to in modernity? We're almost seeking out. We're seeking yep. out deserts because it's like, well, where's we haven't got any more frontiers. We're yep. given uh, an eternal, infinite comfort, but we're like, well, what do, what yep. do we do? What do we do? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I completely agree that. I mean, the, the desert for so long uh, was the sort of uh, the idea of the exterior, right? It's, it's, it's the place of exteriority for Western civilization, right? It, it's the outside into which we can continually expand. Um, uh, but what happens when that disappears and there is no more exterior uh, w when the frontiers close? Um, uh, you know, I, I, so I, th I think, yeah, uh, the, the desire for, in, in my view, I, I use, I'm, I'm really obsessed with this phrase from Deleuze and Guattari, desert desire. <laughs> there is a kind of desire to the desert, for the desert. There's a, there's a, a desire to get to the outside, to get to the exterior. Right. Um, but what happens to that desire when capitalism subsumes everything on the planet, you know? Um, uh, and, and so we end up with these, with these deserts in popular culture, Mad Max, uh, uh, and so on, you know, which, which are absolutely enduring. 
you know we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of saturated with deserts often in our, in our pop culture uh, we're obsessed with ideas of of, of wasteland and, and desert mad i mean mad max is a fantastic example i was thinking about this mm-hmm. earlier but i didn't want to i didn't want to draw it in too much but mad max is a really great example because i don't know if you'd you'd agree or disagree with this but mad max one where there's still this semblance of this very absurd insane civilization but still they're all sort of pretending that the world world hasn't turned into this absolute madhouse Mm -hmm. feels more like a desert to me than mad max 2 where they're quite literally in the middle of the desert yeah yeah, yeah. and that's sort of that you know there's a brilliant thing that you say early on in your book where you say that the confrontation of modernity is ultimately accepting we're within a world which is not a world, which is really yep. what's happening in Mad Max One, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. It's almost like a, like an absurd begging, like please just let there be enough of a world so I can yeah. go on about my day. I don't have yeah. to admit to the desert. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, in a way, I, I like I, I teach Mad Max too, and and in many ways it's uh it's an optimistic film, right? Whereas Mad Max One is the really bleak film mm. because in Mad Max Two it ends with uh, you know the the settlers leaving the desert on the path to a place they call paradise. Right? Mm-hmm. It's a retelling of 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 the story of the biblical Hebrews uh, being led out of the desert by the uh, um, by the by the you know, uh, uh, salvationary figure. Um, uh, uh, so, so yeah, uh, and of, so in, in in a sense, Mad Max too provides the imaginary for that worldless experience which we get in mad max one uh and and yeah so worldlessness is another idea that i was quite obsessed with in the book um uh and 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 i guess it uh uh yeah it's also related to to you know modernity itself um uh there's a great book by sean gaston uh uh, on the concept of world, I think it's called from the concept of world from Kant to Derrida, where he said Kant was the first philosopher to say that world isn't isn't created; we make the world, right? And that's the central kind of crisis experience of modernity, right? The world isn't given to us by a creator; we make it, and if we make it this way, we can make it another way. There's no reason why the world should be the way it is, and so the world we could wake up one day and the world is no longer there. Um, mm. That that's both fright that's both frightening, but it's also kind of hopeful in a sense. It's it's a revolutionary message too. And yeah, it, it sort of comes across in your book that you you perhaps feel that no one really feels as if there is a world, capital W world, for them to grasp onto. But it's all a bit of a we're in a bit of a pretense, you know. As you say, capitalism subsumes everything with this Deleuze mm-hmm. Deleuze Guattarian sort of conception of capitalism as this sort of I don't know, you know, outside beast, which is just sticks its finger into everything mm-hmm. people end up in this just complete flux and there's nothing to there's no anchors anymore for the world no signposts uh, in a way well yeah yeah absolutely i mean i mean that's that's also pretty much heidegger's uh argument right um uh, uh so heidegger's account of of the desert is uh is worldlessness um uh and it, he says the the essential an activity of human beings as opposed to animals is is world building uh but the experience of living in a world that isn't actually a world that that's that's for heidegger he didn't say capitalism but he said modern technology right uh and and you know Deleuze and guitar say pretty much the same thing right? except except they call it deterritorialization right? mm, mm. yeah yeah our sense of being uh in a territory uh is kind of constantly eroded uh, uh, and we're brought face to face with some idea of deterritorialized existence. Do you think that's the ultimate pursuit of capitalism? If we could, if, if we could speak for it, is always trying to keep up with what's being deterritorialized. Right? It can never. So I mean, I guess this is a big question. I mean, in the sense of capitalism in the desert are almost like two sides of this this thing we're talking about. But like mm-hmm. capitalism, unfortunately, it doesn't want to admit it. It needs the desert. And oh yeah. Never it, even though it probably wants to subsume it, it can never do that because to do that it doesn't have the alterity. It doesn't have this thing mm-hmm. to be like, oh there's that, that yep, horrible yep. wilderness that you could fall into if you're not here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So so capitalism needs this opposition between sedentary and nomadic space. Uh, well, what Deleuze and Guattari call it, they call it the uh, um uh 
a striated and smooth space. So like an like a striated space would be like a, a city map with a grid, right? Mm. It's the, this is the the space of the state, right? Uh, the state being a sort of transcendent view, looking down on space, mapping it out. Uh, it's a coordinate space, but smooth space is a space where you're completely imminent with it, yeah, and, mm. and you're flowing through it. And that opposition for Deleuze and Guattari is fundamental uh, uh, to to the history of capitalism. Capitalism constantly needs new smooth spaces, but it can never, as you say, uh, contain or assimilate those smooth spaces. It always needs to re-territorialize on, on some conception of, of state space or striated space. Um, uh, uh, and, and, that, and, and that, I think, is kind of the situation today. You don't think they could ever begin to bleed into one another? Well, they do bleed into one another, but I think th the opposition constantly needs to be reformed. Uh, uh, and you know, this is this is why the the state is an integral part of capitalism, uh, and why ultimately, like Hart and Negri and Empire were wrong. You know, uh, the state, uh, uh, the state is a you know the nation state is, is is fundamental to the operation of capitalism. It can't just be a global empire. It can't just be that. Um, uh, it because it needs to re-territorialize on a state space, uh, even as it tries to subsume these 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 other spaces outside of it. Um, why why does it need the state? Well, it needs the state to to re-territorialize. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it needs the state to to, to re-territorialize on, on on a system of power, I guess. Um, other, otherwise, you know. Uh, capitalism inevi inevitably gives away to something else. Um, it makes me wonder where the, where are the frontiers? Because it's almost like all the frontiers we're being given at the moment are these cheap versions of frontiers. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, meta. What's it called? Meta. Metaverse. The right? metaverse. Yeah. Well, recreate yeah. the world we already have in digital mm. space. Re-exploration yeah. of capitalism, sort of yeah. 3.0 or whatever. Well, yeah, well, I, I mean, interestingly, the, the idea of the metaverse comes from uh, Neil Stevenson's novel from 1992, Snow Crash, where, where you have this guy, he's just living in a like a storage container, and he just puts on his metaverse goggles, and he's in this, like, sumptuous bar uh, with all of these, you know, these billionaires, but he's just, like, sitting at home in this, in, in, in this like, storage space. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess that, I mean, a, a, another sense of the frontier of the desert would, would be the digital one, you know, the internet is a kind of desert in, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do you, why do you think it is that it's, you know, I mean, quite literally since, I mean, as far as my understanding is the first sort of recorded text that, that is full, full ish is like the Epic of Gilgamesh, which itself, uh, I believe spends quite a fair bit of time in the desert. So, I mean, really, basically, we can say since recorded history, the notion of the desert, mm -hmm. even then, was already becoming this. We understand intuitively, instinctively as humans that the, the, the desert is this strange wilderness place that needs to be for us to have this sort of cross-correlation between things. Why do, you, why do you think it is that, you know, this metaphor has, has survived such a long time? Uh well, yeah. I mean, you talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh. You could also talk about, um, uh, you know, the the ancient Egyptians and and the hieroglyph from which we get the word desert uh, uh, is, is essentially the opposition of of the, the fertile black land near the Nile, and then and then the the, the barren red land. So, in some sense, you know, societies need an opposition of barren and fertile. Or even maybe sedentary and uh, and nomadic uh, to kind of form an image of themselves. Um, there's an interesting uh, uh, environmental American environmental philosopher called Paul Shepard. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Nature and Madness, and he is he's a really interesting chapter on the desert in that book. And he says all of the core concepts of Western civilization uh, come from the experience of living on the edges of the desert. Mm. Uh, uh, of not quite being uh, sedentary, but also not quite being nomadic. Uh, so it's, in, in one sense, the 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 this in, the enduring image of the desert is comes from an anxiety over which side of that opposition do you belong on, right? 
because the desert, in many ways, again, is the desire. There is a desire for the desert. Right? We desire to to leave the sedentary world, to leave civilization, follow the flows, uh, the deterritorialized flows out into the desert. Right? Dillers and Guattari say that's what the schizophrenic does. That schizophrenic desire right? deterritorializes desire, takes it right out into the desert. Right? Um, but of course, that's a that's a suicidal project ultimately. We have to kind of re-territorialize some, somewhere. Um, uh, so in a sense for me, and, and I mean, you know, the, the history of uh, Judeo-Christian traditions also have this tension between, uh, 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 you know, the sedentary and the nomadic. Um, uh, 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 Abel uh, was, was, a, was a pastoralist, a nomad. Cain was a farmer. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, Cain's punishment was to till the land, right? Uh, whereas Abel was was, um, uh, yeah, was it was a nomad to some extent. Um, so yeah, the, I think I think it has to do fundamentally with our attachments to space. Uh, do you desire the desert? Do you desire to take your line of flight? And... Yes, yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I do. I and I yeah, I do. Um but it's also terrifying, you know. Uh uh, uh a completely deterritorialized desire to Dillas and Gasari says is the most you know, is the most terrifying thing uh imaginable. Right. And and they say that all societies have this vision of the desert that they that they pull back from. Right? Uh uh and you know uh, this is this is one of the reasons why apocalypses are kind of feature so much throughout uh, throughout history. Uh, the vision of the apocalypse is is the vision of this deterritorialized desire, um, but it's also precisely the the revolutionary image as well that Deleuze and Guattari are kind of going for. Um, uh, but again, I think this explains why our culture is is so obsessed with deserts of different kind, Dune, uh, Mad Max. Uh, they seem to be everywhere. Mm. Um, same with the same with the apocalyptic fiction at the moment. You know? And apocalyptic since fiction. the early two thousands. Yeah, yeah all really, we can think of. Yeah. Well, actually, exactly. probably before that, since the sort of postmodern era, mm. we or the postmodern era. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But well, we can. Yeah. Yeah, that it's a really interesting thing that there was a rebirth of this at that time, alongside this really the, the absolute birth of capitalism as we know it now, right? The nineteen eighties onward or seventies onwards. Yeah. Is also yeah. on the flip side this rebirth of apocalypse of a reset of a restart yeah. of a plea we like a like a need for catharsis mm-hmm. mm. uh yeah absolutely and um uh and and it's also the death of utopia right uh you try to think of the utopias the um wh- where are our are, are utopias uh and it's interesting that you mentioned the the 80s um uh and and that kind of that kind of postmodernist milieu uh i think uh, so a thinker such as Baudrillard, you know, he wrote um, um, his 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 weird travelogue America in the middle of of the eighties. Um, uh, he was obsessed with what he called the the, uh, the desert of of speed. You know, he would just drive through the American desert landscapes of the desert Southwest in his car, and and he said, "This is you know, this is this is where culture comes to die. This is post um, American post modernity uh, uh, is you know." It's where European culture dies, and it dies in the desert. What do you, what do you uh, think? He, what do you think he meant by that? Are we sort of here? Are we thinking about sort of, you know, some some just completely detached gas station in the middle of nowhere that's become this sort of fragment of a, you know, if you were to see that and know nothing else about the civilization, you'd just be some absurd, yeah, revelation. Yeah, yeah and, and in many ways, it's you know, uh, you read that book and Baudrillard for all his kind of radicalism comes across as, as like a kind of a, a, a French yeah, kind of gentleman, uh, kind of Victorian gentleman, you know, he's kind of appalled at what he sees when he, he travels through, you know, Colorado and, and, uh, you know, Nevada. Um, he's just, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he's just trying to make sense of it all. Uh, but for him, for Baudrillard in that book, uh, the desert is 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 primarily an optical space. Mm. Uh, he says it's 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 the desert of the movies. Uh, 
when you when you go to the real desert, this goes back to one of your earlier questions. When you go to the real desert, or when at least when Baudrillard went to the real desert, what he found was the deserts of Hollywood. He says, you know, uh, you know, the the real desert is precisely where you find the simulacrum of popular culture. Uh, and again, that was I, I don't talk about it that much in 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 the book, but uh, I found that really interesting as well. So, the, so venturing to the desert then almost seems like a an now an impotent task in terms of finding the real right it's like well there must be something there but you get there and you've you've taken something with you and it's already become it's like a maddening labyrinth an internal labyrinth of capitalism that you can't escape mm -hmm. yeah well the, uh, welcome to the desert of the real right that was the <laughs> famous was the famous line uh in in the matrix which was taken taken out of baudrillard's book um but yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, when I guess you you raised the point of internality, mm. uh, uh, and that's interesting too because Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the of, of the desert and and what you know I'm kind of calling desert desire um, is rooted in their critique of psychoanalysis. Uh, and there's an inter Lacan has an interesting reference to the desert in one of his texts where he says that. Um, uh, the body must become a desert of jouissance. That's the pleasure principle. What he means is that, so for Lacan, jouissance is uh, excessive desire, right? It's desire on which which is is so intense that uh, it's a form of suffering. Right? Uh, I, I, and so to maintain pleasure, you have to you have to render uh, the level of jouissance at, at at a complete minimum. You have to have like a like a zero or just a very minimal amount of jouissance. Right? Mm. So the body has to constantly expel this excessive desire and make itself a desert. Um, and that's a really interesting idea as well. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's one of the things I, I, I try to explore, you know, although I don't talk about Lacan that much in the book, but um, this relationship between desire, the li you know, libidinal uh, attachments and, and, and the desert is something I, I talk about a fair bit. Um, you, you also have a figure like um, uh, T.E. Lawrence, famous Lawrence of Arabia, who did have a strange libidinal attraction to the desert. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, Lawrence was was a very um, strange guy. Uh, uh, he, uh, according to his his, his biography, various bi biographies, he was uh, a masochist. Um, he liked to be whipped and beaten. Mm. Uh, 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 but 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 he also had a had a horror of intercourse. Right? Uh, okay. Some people say he was gay. Well, he wasn't. I don't think it was that he was gay. He just had a horror of actual uh, uh, sexual intercourse. Mm. But um, if you read his, uh, his like his epic Seven Pillars of Wisdom, there are these moments where he's he seems like sexually aroused by by the the cleanliness and the sparseness of the desert. Right? So there there's almost a uh, uh, a desire for for that kind of uh, um, cleansing of the body that that he associates with the desert, and also with with the with the Arabs, with the with the Bedouin Arabs that he meets there. Mm. Um, so, the, in that sense, the desert becomes this sort of internal tool. So, do you think there's? Yeah. Do you think, in a very difficult way, I mean, it's the weird thing about the desert that it's it encapsulates so much, which is actually, I mean, this is going back to the and Qatari really big when they say nothing ever died of contradictions the desert mm. is this space of like you know an absent labyrinth that you know you're going to enter into it it's inhuman but we know it's this natural phenomena but mm -hmm. we know there's there's something there but there isn't anything there so you're mm -hmm. entering into this just absolute paradox but that's more enjoyable or more at least there's something there compared to what yeah. i'm coming from where everything's defined so it's like it's mm -hmm. i mean i mean i guess in that sense is is entering into the desert always some form of masochism for people you know capitalism's comfort on the other hand you think at least this is going to be some form of uh challenge to my being mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think for Deleuze and Guattari the idea of the desert uh uh it kind of short circuits the opposition between hedonism and and denial uh that is the kind of the that's the capitalistic logic right and it is the logic of of Freud as well, in in many senses, like you, you can enjoy uh, 
uh, to a certain extent, but not now. You have to wait till later. That's the pleasure principle, right? You can, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you can, um, you know, the super ego or orders you to enjoy in a certain way. Right? Uh, so you deny yourself now so that you can enjoy later. It's kind of an economics of desire, right? Uh, and it's and one, one of the big critiques of psychoanalysis, of Deleuze and Guattari uh, provide an anti Oedipus is that. You know how can how can psychoanalysis be this this revolutionary thing if it if it basically has the same economic principles as capitalism? Uh, so really, what they're striving for is some sort of uh, some way of thinking the economics of desire beyond that calculus of enjoyment versus denial, right? mm -hmm. which for them reaches a kind of crisis point with Lacan, because uh, because Lacan. You know, can't really. Lacan brings psychoanalysis to to as far as it can go, and it can't go beyond that. Uh, so the desert for them offers offers this image, or this kind of this conceptual topology in which they can think kind of excess, but also lack at the same time. There's no there's no kind of uh, there's no contradiction between the two things. There's a line that I like. It's in a thousand plateaus, which is where they say even the drying up of the spring is a flow. Everything is a flow. Even the absence of something is a flow. Um, so the desert then becomes not this area or, or this this site of deprivation and asceticism, uh, but this this site of excess, uh, where where flows are liberated. Um, it's a really really beautiful idea. Um, uh, but yeah, what do you think the the common trepidation is? You know, the internal fear, in a way, of taking that step into the into the quote unquote desert. Why is where does is that a product or a symptom of capitalism, or is that a symptom of something? You know, I mean, the, the classics are almost like a Lovecraftian. I just don't know what that is. Fear. Yeah, 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 um, uh, yeah. I guess it's. It's both, isn't it? It's that it's that fear of a, a, a kind of the alterity of the earth itself, that kind of Lovecraftian terror of going somewhere. Like I was thinking about uh, the other day, the, the at the mountains of madness, where where these kind of uh, Antarctic explorers or the, is it the Arctic or the Antarctic? I can't remember, but but they go to one of the poles and the, and they unearth this ancient civilization, the old ones, and they're driven in, you know, driven insane as characters in Lovecraft so often are. Uh, I think I think there is a lot of that, but it, um, I mean, it's it's also just a. Uh, the tendency for self-destruction, which is kind of built into capitalism as well. Um, this is something that Deleuze and Guattari really talk about a lot in A Thousand Plateaus. Uh, uh, it is one of the things that distinguishes that book from anti Oedipus. They say, you know, you need to be cautious. You can't deterritorialize too fast or you'll destroy yourself mm. or you'll turn into a fascist, right? Because mm. uh, fascism... Uh, for Deleuze and Guattari is, is this will to pure annihilation, just to, just destroy everything. Uh, for them, it's not really a totalitarianism. It has nothing to do with the state. It's just a, a desire for self-destruction. Right? Mm. Uh, and so that they call that a line of abolition. Right? That's when the line of desire, the line of flight turns bad. It becomes a line of abolition or a line of death. Um, and so in many ways, we're, we are right to be kind of cautious of that. Mm. Uh, 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 and Deleuze and Guattari would, would say that any ethics would, would need to, you know, uh, in, include, you know, a, a note of caution in that sense. Mm. I mean, it makes it makes me think just to almost like pinpoint a moment to br bring in another film, which, uh, you know, I really enjoy. I watch it every now and again because there's a moment in it that I love so much. But Falling Down, yes. where the, you know, the protagonist is almost this, at the beginning, he's the product of capitalism in a way, right? He's every capitalistic social cliche is thrown at him you know his yeah. wife won't let him see the kids he's working this lame job he's fully suited in like the classic suit and ties yeah, yeah. his aircon won't work in his car and he's caught in a traffic jam it's like yeah. a big cliche and all of a sudden like that's the moment he enters into the desert right where he just goes yeah something clicks he opens the car door he's i'm not so he's in he's then in he's entered the desert yeah somehow he enters he enters the desert yeah from it's, within it's modernity a... <laughs> from within from within modernity and and he ends up like wandering these 
these really it's 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 yeah it's, it's a great example of that film he, he ends up wandering these uh kind of wastelands uh, uh around los angeles right uh uh uh, and and there's a bit where he's like leaning against a, 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 some rock or something that that's been spray painted, and he's just like he thinks this is just a nowhere place, right? It's just it's just an abandoned territory. And then these these kind of two gang members come along and say, "Hey, this is our this is our territory, right? You're, you're trespassing." Um, uh, uh, and then, yeah, uh, uh, but it's interesting. Yeah, isn't he? Um, isn't that character in that film? Doesn't he work for? A weapons company or something like that. Yeah, he might I think, possibly. Do, I think yeah. he does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and of course, there's that fascist character as well. Uh, the 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 kind of the, the white supremacist Nick mm. uh, that he meets. Yeah. But it, but it's a peculiar example because, in a certain sense, he's almost it's cathartic when he be- he begins. You think it's something we've all. I mean, almost the other the other example is probably my favorite film ever, and it's influenced me too much in my life. But Office mm. Office Space, right, is the other example of this. <laughs> yeah. You know, of uh, I've done nothing today, and it was the best day of my life. Is like, yeah. well, we all want to do that. So there's two sides to this coin of this, like dangerous, like all right, he's had his cathartic moment in falling down, but as the viewer, yep. you're like, this is not. This isn't going to end well. No. But on the other co- the other the other side, office space is like, oh, we all want to do that, but we also know it's not going to end well because you you understand in that mm. moment he has to abide by capitalism because he's yeah. he's going to end up homeless. So yeah, there's yeah, always yeah. This, there's this weird trepidation, but it's it's just something I you know I'd love to maybe not pin, maybe you can never pinpoint it, but what's what's happening in that moment you know where mm-hmm. something flicks and you're you're in the you're in the desert. Yeah, yeah, it's something flicks and you're in the desert. Yeah. Um, I mean, in falling down, it, it becomes a line of destruction, right? Mm. It becomes a, a line of abolition. Uh, and that's, that's the great tension of that movie. You don't know where it's going to lead, you know, is it, in, is it going to be some liberatory thing? But, uh, the fact that it can't, that, that, you know, he doesn't have any other options. Like it's just, as soon as he leaves that car, he's just down the road to this kind of self-destructive end. Mm. Um, uh, uh, so I guess in, in in some sense, yeah, when we enter into the desert, in that capitalist environment, we're just we're just forced down this line of de- line of self destruction. Uh, and as you say, in office space, yeah, they come up with this uh, ingenious plan, but, but they're kind of fully invested in the capitalist machine at the same time. Mm. Uh, yeah. Do you think there is a there is a positive? escape via the desert in a certain sense something something that could be const- i mean this is i guess what the loads could and guattari and or everyone afterwards has probably been trying to theorize is can something be constructed in the desert which isn't subsumed back into you know the place you wish to exit well yeah i i, I mean yeah i think so i mean if you look at the uh you look at the history of utopias look at a place like uh acrosanti in in arizona it was this like desert commune uh uh that's one example you know there are lots of other examples of like desert utopias uh where the desert offers this this kind of space to completely rethink everything uh to completely strip everything bare and start again uh and so that's i guess that's the uh that's the kind of revolutionary idea that Toulouse and Guattari invest in the schizophrenic uh, the schizophrenic takes desire out into this potentially utopian place, uh, but the potential for fascism is also there. Potential for, you know, becoming Michael Douglas and falling down is also there, right? So it's this, it's this really, uh, it's this really politically ambiguous space, um, but it's also utopian. Uh, um, uh, one of my problems with uh, with the new Dune film, hmm. I thought it it, it didn't. It didn't capture any sense of utopia or possibility, um, which I think is is in the book more, uh, and certainly in the David Lynch film uh, from from the nineteen eighties. But it's absolutely uh, yeah, it's absolutely in the book. I think there's even subtle sort of heroics in the book that didn't come through. The new film mm-hmm. was uh, the new film was very it was good, but it was something was missing, as you say. Yeah, yeah. And aesthetically, it's probably the best we could hope for. <laughs> Aesthetically, yeah, yeah. Aesthetically, it's too gloomy, though. I thought it's mm. it's not. It wasn't baroque enough. It wasn't weird enough. But I mean, my my first exposure to the Dune story was as a kid, and I rented Dune on a video when I was like ten years old. I had no idea what it was, and I was just like, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> um, so so that left an impact on me. 
uh, a big impact on me, I, I, I guess. So, so nothing could possibly live up to that. And, uh, but mm. yeah, it was okay. Mm. I mean, just sort of to bring in the other aspect, I mean, one thing you, you do focus on as well in the book that we haven't spoken about too much this night, mm. you know, with the desert of geo philosophy, right? And this is something that's obviously yeah. quite pertinent uh, and important today with regards to this same idea of possibility and potential coming from the desert you know in relation to how we're treating the world that the desert mm-hmm. as a as a geographical location is is mm-hmm. it's you know to, i mean we keep bringing in I, well we both keep bringing in capitalism as this example mm-hmm. but what capitalism tends to do is make you ignore there, there, there's like it's like there's no ge- geographical structure to capitalism if you're within it you don't think about mountains you don't think about soil content you don't think about terrains or mm-hmm. topology <clears throat> you just you're just within this mm-hmm. even if it's hilly it's flat it's it's, yeah. it's capitalism so yeah, yeah. The, the, the desert sort of reimbues you with this geophilosophical spirit yeah no it's true um uh and and like what you're saying reminds me of what, what heidegger heidegger's term um a standing reserve he said, with, with with modern technology, nature, the earth becomes just this standing reserve, a kind of resource. So the Rhine just becomes a, a, a source of energy for a hydroelectric dam. Uh, uh, and, you know, for capitalism, deserts are generally places of resource extraction or uh, nuclear weapons testing. If you, if you read uh, Rebecca Solnit's book, uh, Savage Dreams, Fantastic! A book about uh, uh, about Americans, uh, 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 the American military testing weapons in 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 the, in the American Southwest. Um, so, for capitalism, the desert just becomes this this sort of site of um, uh, uh, j- just this thing to be used up, mm. uh, just this just just a sheer resource or, or a dumping ground, uh, just a pure wasteland. Uh, and and so, I guess. Um, a lot of what I'm saying is pessimistic, but but you you suggest a, a more optimistic reading of the desert here, where we are you know, put in touch with the earth, mm. uh, um, and that is literally what Deleuze and Guattari say. They say in Anti Oedipus that the desert is you know the way the schizophrenic regains contact with the earth, um, and that's really interesting to me as well. I guess um, nature here is not the verdant you know, a overabundant nature that we, we tend to think of or our, our kind of Western Eurocentric view of nature is green. Um, it's not that. It's it's uh, it's something geological. Uh, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's attaining a kind of intimacy with the earth um, in the ruins of, in, of the worldlessness that we confront. That gives us, I think, uh, some sort of ecological hope uh, in a way. So you're more, you, are you more sort of pessimistic about the potentials of the desert? That really, is, I, I, uh, it is a yeah. wasteland. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, Nietzsche says we we need to traverse the the wasteland, right? So, so for Nietzsche, uh, the wasteland is the key figure of nihilism. Nihilism is the European disease, right? Mm. It's it's uh, um, essentially what happens when we no longer believe in God, but we don't have anything else to believe in. Mm. That's nihilism, essentially. Um, and all we can do at that point is is to assert nothingness, because we don't know what else to assert. Right? We have nothing else to believe in. Um, but what Nietzsche also says is the way through nihilism is an active nihilism. Um, uh, and and Deleuze repeats this uh, a number of in his book on Nietzsche and, and elsewhere. Uh, and so, in a sense, there is a a kind of a positive, hopeful vision of. Uh, a desert that corresponds to this idea of of an active nihilism, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a place of discovery or a site of renewal, uh, and I think we should look towards indigenous peoples, uh, and 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 which is something that I really haven't done in my book, to my shame. But we should look towards uh, kind of non-Western philosophies and indigenous peoples and and how they view the desert. Uh, of course, one of the interesting things is that the desert is itself a kind of Western category. It's kind of a thing that Westerners have invented for a place that they don't come from. Uh, there's there's a, a geologist, Michael Welland, who says that the, the term desert means nothing to the people of Central Australia, right? Mm. To them, it's just their land, right? Like desert doesn't 
doesn't really mean anything or it means something so different that it has very little in common with our western notion of desert um so i guess in that sense we have to we have to leave the concept of desert behind in some sense uh uh, uh as a, as a uh, maybe a relic of our own eurocentric consciousness of place um, i th i think whatever happens is, is, uh and a new awareness, a new consciousness of place that goes beyond this opposition of sedentary and nomadic has to happen. Um, that's a big, it's a big ask, you know, not to retreat back to capitalism where you're comfy mm -hmm. and, not, and not to go through yeah. the desert, but to yeah. find something else. Do, you, do yeah. you have, have you theorized of any idea what that thing or place could, could look like, could be? I don't know. I mean, I think it, it requires the abolition of the state, but that's that's the ultimate utopia, right? Um, uh, uh, but how we, you know, how we do that, I, d I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, a lot of work on the Anthropocene being done kind of touches on a lot of what we've just been talking about. Um, uh, so I think, um, yeah how we conceive our Anthropocene condition is very relevant to to how we imagine it. Uh, a new politics of space. Um, uh, one of the questions you sent me related to Latour. Mm. Um, and I think Latour's recent work is how, how, how not to do it, in my view. Um, oh, really? In some senses, yeah. I, I'm thinking here of his book, Down to Earth. Um, uh, and and also um uh, the one and the lectures on Gaia whatever that book was called uh, um, facing Gaia facing Gaia yeah, yeah. Uh, the Gifford lectures um he, so Latour there he argues for a kind of a Schmittian a left Schmittian politics in other words a politics of territories um, so for Karl Schmidt uh, who's a German jurist Nazi you know in, kind of friend of Heidegger's but uh, um. Well, not friend, but but he's kind of notorious for that reason. But but for him, politics was ultimately about territory, mm. uh, 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 and and about the struggle over territory and over boundaries and over borders. Uh, and so Latour is saying we have to give up, you know, capitalist dreams of globalization and and reassert some sort of uh, politics of territory. Right? And he says, and he says, you you know, it it sounds yeah, even if we, if we risk a kind of Nazi blood and soil uh kind of ideology so be it this is what we have to do we have to get in touch with the earth again um uh, but i think that's absolutely you know that's really dangerous i think blood and soil politics is you know the absolute danger that we face today um, well, so the alternative for you is a sort of uh anarcho eco centered nomadic uh, uh in a sense yes although i you know um I'm not sure how we get there, and I'm, I'm not, you, you know, advocating some you know, sudden abolition of the state. But ultimately, uh, uh, you know, the state is is bound so directly to our to our ideas of of territorial security, uh, uh, and our you know ideas of kind of ethnic belonging that it, it it has to become a relic of any politics for the future. It has to be left behind. Um, uh, and and so yeah, so politically, I would be kind of yeah eco nomadic in that in that sense. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. okay. Uh, is there anything we haven't touched on about your book or about the desert you'd like to uh, add in? Oh, I don't know. We talked about it so much. Um, uh, No, I mean, I think we've, we've talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I believe we, so it's Edinburgh University Press was the publisher. It's Edinburgh University Press, yeah. And I think they have, they may have an affordable paperback copy of it okay. out now. So go and buy it. Yeah, I'll be sure to put the links for that uh, in the description below. Are you, are you working on uh, any more desert themed books or is there a new? Yeah, projects? I'm, 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 I'm editing or in the process of, of, uh, editing a, a collection with um, uh, Selena Asuna, who is a post 
graduate researcher in uh, Arizona State University. She works a lot on deserts. Um, uh, so we're we're trying to put a, a volume together called Story Deserts, uh, Reimagining Arid Environments. That's the full title. Um, but when that will be out or who with, I don't yet know. But but so yeah, I'm continuing continuing an interest in the desert. Uh, but um, but yeah. Okay. Well, that yeah. seems like a very good place to finish up. Uh, yeah. Aiden Tynan, thanks very much. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me on the podcast.